Hello, I'm Dr. Russell Barkley, and I'm a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center in Richmond, Virginia, in the United States, of course. And today I want to speak with you about the nature of ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, as a disorder of executive functioning and self-regulation. I'm going to explain what this means for not only a deeper understanding of ADHD, but also for its implications for the management of the disorder, of which, as you will see, there are numerous such implications. Now, to begin with, it helps to understand ADHD from the perspective of a clinical scientist like myself. We do have the diagnostic manual for mental disorders version of ADHD that sets out all of the 18 symptoms and the other criteria that a clinician would use to make the diagnosis. That's fine. That's a description of symptoms. It describes someone's behavior and how we might recognize the disorder in that person from their behavior. But it's not really an explanation of the disorder itself. It certainly isn't a conceptualization of ADHD, uh, nor does it provide us a theory of ADHD. What is going wrong in normal development that would lead someone <clears throat> excuse me, to show these behaviors that are listed in our diagnostic manual? And that's the point of today's lecture. That is to show you how ADHD can be best viewed as a disorder of self-regulation. And because self-regulation depends on the brain's executive functions, we of course have to go into the nature of executive functioning as well. But let me show you how a clinical researcher looks at ADHD rather than the way a clinician might look for it using the diagnostic symptoms. We currently think of ADHD as involving a developmental delay in two different dimensions or traits of human psychological development neuropsychological development specifically, because these traits have a lot to do with how the brain is developing and functioning. Now, the first of these two traits or sets of behaviors that are not developing properly is that, <clears throat> excuse me, known as the hyperactive impulsive dimension of ADHD or executive inhibition. <clears throat> excuse me. Now, this dimension is the first to develop in terms of the deficits that we see in ADHD. And we see this not only in the fact that the child is very hyperactive, restless, and fidgeting, and moving around a great deal, but we also see it in excessive talking and verbal behavior and interrupting others. <clears throat> That is how the diagnostic manual would describe this particular dimension. <clears throat> but clinicians like myself, who also do research, know that this problem with impulsiveness or lack of inhibition extends to other domains of functioning. <clears throat> For instance, we know that there is a mental aspect to this impulsiveness, what we think of as cognitive disinhibition. The individual has difficulty suppressing thoughts that are not relevant to the goal that they're pursuing or the task at hand. We also see it in the fact that they make very rapid decisions about what is happening around them and in their mind, very rapid decisions about what they're going to do without a lot of contemplation or thoughtfulness put into thinking about what they should be doing. So there's not a lot of reflection going on here in the mind of someone with ADHD. Their thoughts are coming rather rapidly. They're not very relevant to what is happening. They're very distracting. And the person makes very rapid decisions based upon these thoughts. Another form of impulsiveness that we see is one of motivation. 
the individual finds it very difficult to delay gratification and to work for a larger goal that is delayed or longer term. Instead, the person is more governed by the immediate rewards in a situation, the small immediate consequences, what they can get <clears throat> now, excuse me, and uh, that is what dominates their behavior. So we find that it's very hard for them to work over time toward a future goal because that goal that is distant in the future doesn't really motivate them very well. They're not so interested in that. They don't value it very much. Psychologists refer to this as temporal discounting or reward discounting. And that is simply that the longer a consequence is delayed before its occurrence, the less value it has in motivating someone. And people with ADHD show a very steep discounting of rewards based on their delay. They just don't value them as much. Finally, there's another form of impulsiveness that isn't mentioned in our diagnostic manual, but is very important for ADHD. Indeed, it's a central feature of ADHD as much as any of the other forms of impulsiveness that I've mentioned here, and that is emotional impulsiveness, or what might be called emotional dysregulation. And that is that the person shows very poor self-control over their emotions. And we see this in two forms. The first is that their emotions are expressed very quickly, very impulsively, so that when an event happens that provokes strong emotion, their emotions are being displayed very fast. Whereas in someone else, they might be suppressed. And then the individual would have time to think about it a little bit as to how they want to express that emotion. But not in ADHD. Here we see that the emotion is up, out, and expressed without regard for its appropriateness for this situation or what it means for the longer term welfare of that person. The second part of this emotional dysregulation is that the person has trouble down regulating, that is moderating or softening or dampening the emotion once the strong emotion has occurred. So that the self-control of emotion that we all show, where we inhibit the strong emotion, talk to ourselves, calm ourselves down, try to self-soothe and otherwise lessen the emotion before we express it because we know that in doing so, it's going to be more supportive of our welfare. We're not going to get into as much difficulty with others if we are able to moderate our emotions. People think of this as emotional maturity or emotional intelligence. But people with ADHD had trouble with both of these. They show their emotions very quickly and once they show them, they have trouble getting control over them now and moderating them so that they're supportive of their welfare. Now, as I said, this is the trait that explains the hyperactivity that we see in many young children with ADHD. But that restlessness and hyperactivity declines very steeply over development so that by adolescence, it isn't as prominent and by adulthood, it's no longer of much value in diagnosing someone with ADHD. It's not to say that they're not restless, but they're certainly not very hyperactive or climbing on things or showing their gross motor activity level to the extent that they did as young children. They may describe it as more of a subjective restlessness or an inner feeling of needing to be busy and doing many things, uh, but they're certainly not climbing on furniture or sliding down the railings or banisters of uh, stairways and things like that. Uh, so that kind of gross motor hyperactivity is declining very steeply with age. But the problems with inhibition and that they create across all of these domains of behavior uh, persist into adulthood to a large extent. Now, when we look at the second dimension 
of ADHD that is not developing well. It is the dimension of attention, of course. But we in research think of it as executive attention or executive functioning because it's a very special kind of attention. Let me explain. The problem specifically here with ADHD is in the ability to persist over time toward a goal. And while there are at least six kinds of attention that are mediated through our brain, ADHD isn't disrupting all of these kinds of attention. It's disrupting specifically persistence toward goals, the ability to stay on task, complete the work, and accomplish the goal. So we can think of this as attention to the future. So it's not attention to the now and what's going on around you. It's paying attention and persisting toward the goals that you're trying to accomplish or that you've been told to do, like when a teacher assigns a task to a student to do at their desk. Can the individual sustain action over time toward that goal in order to complete it successfully? And that's what people with ADHD struggle to do, is to pay attention toward the future and persist in their actions toward that future goal. Now, the ability to persist over time toward a goal requires that we be able to suppress distractions that are not relevant to the goal, so that when distracting events occur around us, we don't respond to them. We're busy pursuing the goal at hand. People with ADHD can't suppress responding to those distracting events so that when they occur, they attend to them. And when they attend to them, they're now off task. They're not working on the goal anymore. And they're now pursuing something else. And so they skip from one thing to another to another. As distractions come and go in their life, the distractions are very compelling to them. And the distractions capture their behavior and pull them off task. So ADHD individuals have two problems here. They can't sustain action and persist toward a goal. And they can't resist responding to irrelevant events that have nothing to do with that goal, what we call distractors. Now, there's a third problem here. All of us will get distracted from time to time, especially when something important happens that we didn't expect, but we have to stop what we're doing and deal with that distracting event. And then we re-engage our goal. We go back to the task that we haven't finished and we persist at the task until we complete it. So we have this ability, once distracted, to re-engage the incompleted goal. And people with ADHD can't do that very well. Now, the ability to re-engage goals that we haven't finished once we've been distracted from them is a function of something called working memory. Working memory is a very important mental faculty. It is housed in the front part of the brain. It is where we are holding in mind what we're doing, what the goal is, what the steps are that we hope to use to get to that goal. Where are we in completing that goal and how much is left to do? All of this is being held online, in mind, in this very special form of memory. It's called working memory because it's memory being put to work. More specifically, it's remembering what we're doing. It's what people lose when they age, especially when they get past age 55 or 60, such as myself. We're not losing our long-term memory. We're losing the ability to hold in mind what we wanted to do and to hold it there long enough to get it done. So we become forgetful. We go into a room and we can't remember why we were going there. We go outside to get our mail at our mailbox, but we wind up doing other things and we don't get the mail. That's working memory that we're losing there. And that's what people with ADHD have difficulty with. Once they're distracted, 
their working memory is largely erased and they don't remember what they were doing and therefore they don't get back to what they were doing and so they skip from one thing to another never finishing the things that they start because they can't hold it in mind very well finally this special kind of attention that i'm talking about here called executive attention includes another mental ability and that is self-awareness or self-monitoring it's hard to know whether or not you're off task if you're not monitoring what you're doing during the task and it's hard to know where you are in pursuing a goal and completing your work if you're not monitoring yourself and where you are in your progress toward that goal so self-awareness being aware of myself and what i'm doing all the time is very important to completing our goals to persisting toward the future so you can see then that ADHD involves a lot of very important things under this term called executive attention. It includes persistence toward goals, toward the future, and resistance to distractions and irrelevant events along the way. And if we should get distracted off task, it involves continuing to hold in mind what we were doing and re-engaging that task because of our working memory, our remembering what we're doing. And it also involves being aware of ourselves and pursuing our goal and where we are in progress toward the goal, self-monitoring. These are all very important mental abilities. Now, you wouldn't know it, but I have just described six of the seven major executive functions in the brain these very important mental functions that we need for self-regulation. I've described inhibition, very important, and emotion regulation, also important, and motivation, self-motivation, the third executive function. I've described working memory, which is the fourth of those executive functions. And actually, working memory can be divided into two kinds verbal, talking to ourselves, and visual, using images in our mind. So there's two kinds of working memory that are being disrupted here, not just one. And then, of course, I've also described self-awareness. The only one I haven't mentioned is planning and problem solving, and we'll get to that. So you can see that when a researcher looks at ADHD, like myself, I see that many of the brain's executive functions aren't working very well, and that that's what people are thinking of when they think of ADHD. It's not just an attention deficit, and it's not just hyperactivity. It's a problem with all of these different executive functions. And that is 